Hello, everyone. Thanks for having me, and uh, thank you for coming and and uh, being interested in garbage. So that's what this is about. Hopefully that's not off-putting to anybody. If so, you have your chance to get out. So I'd like to talk to you about uh, uh, anthropogenic litter, which is just another word for, for trash in the environment, and, and microplastic. Here's um, what your lab looks like if you start to measure these kinds of things. Uh, that's data right there. So I will tell you about uh, some introductory comments about both of these topics and then give you an overview of a couple of projects um, that we've been doing in my lab that address, address each of them. So the uh, uh, accumulation of garbage, of trash, is uh, one of those topics of emerging concern. Uh, and it's one that you hear most often in regards to um, the oceans. So we hear about uh, uh, litter accumulations in open ocean gyres or on isolated beaches. Um, also, there's been a lot of documentation that, that plastic and garbage is, is ingested by organisms of all kinds, from zooplankton to, to whales. And then we also know that it breaks down. And by breaking down, it has its own unique kind of toxic properties. This is a, a figure that's busy. I just want to point out that uh, we put this together to illustrate all of the different kinds of garbage that you find in different habitats from these different publications, uh, both in the oceans, which is in the, the left and the right, and in rivers, which is some of the work that we've done. And I put the plastic in red just to say that plastic, plastic is really one of the primary components of the anthropogenic litter or, or garbage pool that we find um, across all of these different ecosystems. And the reason is that we produce a lot of plastic. In fact, uh, plastic production is one of those things that's been accelerating since its um, development. This is a group in Europe that put together production rates for plastic. And you can see the rate of acceleration here. And the uh, plastic industry really produces all sorts of different kinds of chemicals, um, many different polymers with different additives. We can consider some of the dominant um, production types uh, listed there as polyethylene, polypropylene, polystyrene, PVC, and PET. So these are some of the kind of alphabet soup that you hear related to plastics. And in this particular study, they were concluding, for, for Europe anyway, about 50% makes it to a landfill, uh, uh, less than 10% is recycled, and the rest is unaccounted for. So some of those are durable goods that are meant to be used you know, year after year, but some of those um, uh, numbers represent losses to the environment. And one of the places that plastic has been showing up is in uh, small form. So this term microplastic uh, is broadly defined as particles less than five millimeters. It's often less than one millimeter. And here's a, a couple of pieces that we found uh, in one of our study sites in Chicago. You can see there's different kinds of shapes. Plastic comes in all sorts of different um, chemical formulas, and so this corresponds to the shapes that we see as well. There's, there's fibers and fragments and foam and pellets. And there's a, an example there on the right illustrating kind of the, the, the size of some of this stuff. Um, and microplastic, just like other forms of trash, is one of those things that's really persistent and pervasive in ecosystems all over the world. This is one of the um, early kind of syntheses of microplastic data for the open oceans. And you can see that just like for natural materials, for organic um, uh, seaweed, other kinds of natural materials, we get accumulations based upon global ocean circulations. So these are the Pacific, uh, North and South Pacific gyres and elsewhere in a couple of ocean locations where microplastic is concentrating. Uh, uh, there's less work on this in fresh waters, but it turns out that pretty much everywhere you Everywhere scientists have looked for microplastic, we found it. So that includes the Great Lakes, it includes freshwaters, it includes the Arctic Oceans, the deepest parts of the sea. Um, it's, it's all over the place. And it's coming from uh, a number of different sources. We think of plastic uh, as breaking down. It can break down from sunlight, from uh, changes in temperature, freezing and thawing, and uh, fragmenting into smaller pieces. Uh, synthetic textiles are really pervasive in our environment too. They're in our uh, upholsteries and carpets and fabrics, and those break apart into smaller plastic pieces. Some of those enter our wastewater stream and end up in the effluent. 
And then uh, plastic comes in small form, uh, so-called primary microplastic. Uh, uh, these production pellets, or nurdles, are little plastic beads that are used to make larger plastic items. They're melted down. Um, and these have been found on uh, the shores of Lake Erie. And we also put plastic into a number of different consumer products. Cosmetics, soaps um, contain plastic beads and fragments that are designed to um, kind of exfoliate. And they're also used in plenty of industrial cleaners as well. There are all sorts of different ecological effects of these small plastic bits. Uh, they, like I said, have been eaten by all sorts of different things. There's some evidence for um, bioaccumulation or trophic transfer from uh, prey to predator. There are chemicals in plastic, plasticizers, that give the polymers different properties. Uh, these can leach out of the, of the plastic when it's in the environment. And then because plastic is kind of a unique and sometimes hydrophobic surface, it, uh, it can allow other chemicals that are in the water that don't like to be dissolved in water to kind of stick or adsorb to plastic. And then uh, some of the work we've been doing is to try to examine this plastic surface as kind of a novel habitat. It's a unique kind of um, uh, buoyant, hard surface that doesn't naturally exist and so likely selects for unique microbial um, assemblages. Uh, it, this is a, a website that's really great. It's uh, a summary of lots of different research going on on plastic and litter. And I put this up here because um, I think what it effectively conveys to me is that this is a, a, a rapidly growing field of work. And that really it's a field of work that is uh, marine biology. So uh, if you look inland here, there's not a lot of dots in there. There's us, we're by uh, uh, Lake Michigan. That was some of the work that we did. There's a few in, there's one in Canada and a few in Europe. Um, but really, um, limnologists, terrestrial ecologists have, have not really had the chance to make much of a contribution to this field. And it's too bad because um, we have a real opportunity to understand how plastic is moving through our fresh waters because that's where we're most likely to stop it and that's where we're most likely to clean it up and um, uh, I hope through talking to you about it and keeping up with our work that we can um, begin that conversation. And one of the reasons uh, fresh waters aren't included in the research is we're not included in the conceptual diagrams either. This is a illustration um, meant to kind of show how plastic is moving through oceans. And uh, from this perspective, rivers are sources of plastic to the ocean, which they are, uh, and same with cities. But as someone who's a stream ecologist, a freshwater ecologist, I know that, that freshwaters are biologically reactive, they're retentive, um, and there's important dynamics going on upstream, and that uh, we can really work to understand um, what happens before we get to that downstream arrow. So I made my own diagram and added a uh, watershed perspective here, a landscape approach towards understanding the movement of, of litter, of microplastic, where we consider some really critical freshwater ecosystems, lakes, rivers, riparian zones, interactions with urban habitats. Um, these are largely unknown, but really important places to study in terms of where our garbage is going and how it's interacting with our um, wildlife. So we're doing this work, but we have very, very elementary questions. They're uh, basic. We want to know, is the anthropogenic litter, microplastic, is it in fresh water? Well, yeah, it's there, we know. But uh, we want to know how much. We want to know where in these habitats it can be found, what kinds, where it's coming from, uh, microbial uh, interactions, organismal interactions, and chemical interactions. Um, and we really need to do this first uh, because it allows us to prioritize um, research sites, research questions to be asking, and um, is going to position us best to develop the most efficient management and um, uh, policy recommendations. All right, so I'll give you an idea of a, a few things that we've done to see you know, what we're up to and um, where we are and what we don't know still. Our first project I want to introduce you to is about wastewater treatment plant effluent. That's what WWTP stands for. We were uh, sort of inspired to do this work by a project that was done in the UK. This is a, um, a group that was looking at marine sediments, coastal sediments, uh, and finding that, well, at places in the world where there's more people, 
there's more plastic in the sediments. Makes a lot of sense. And then at sites where the uh, wastewater was being dumped into the ocean, there was more plastic than where there wasn't. And then the last graph there on the lower right is showing um, uh, plastic fibers in washing machines. So they would wash a blanket or a fleece or a shirt, and then just take some water out of the washing machine and found plastic fibers. So we're just really kind of copying this, except positioning it in fresh water, where we're uh, sort of wondering, based upon the domestic wastewater stream, the kinds of plastic that might be getting into them, does it go through the treatment process and end up in urban rivers? And because this has an uh, a important microbial element for us, we know it's colonized by microbes, but we want to know, given its wastewater origin, um, what does the microbial life look like on plastic? So we did this particular project at sites around northeastern Illinois. Some of you might recognize these locations. Um, if you're interested in doing field work, this is not the most uh, beautiful or glamorous kind of research to do. These are our study sites. They're, um, they're streams. You know, they may look like ditches or um, construction sites, but these are places of biological interest. So we were in there um, taking some measurements. Uh, we did this particular study using net samples, so we were up and downstream of the effluent, we were recording the volume, we we're following this protocol for digestion where we um, uh, do a digestion and a separation um, and then filter and count. So we also followed this up with separate samples for microbial um, uh, DNA extraction and sequencing. Here's an example of what these filters look like. There's a kind of field of brown on there that represents the remaining organic material, some plant and bug bits, and then you can see the plastic particles as well. So we've got some fragments and foam, fibers, uh, um, pellets. I have a close-up. Here's a look at what some of the pellets and different kinds of fragments look like. So when you look at this stuff, you, you say, well, that doesn't look natural, does it? <laughs> it doesn't seem like it's naturally occurring material. Um, and so we categorized the, the, the different kinds of shapes and counted the totals. Here's an idea of what the, liter what the um, final concentrations look like. If you look at the top there, that's Higgins Creek, that's right by um, O'Hare uh, Airport. And so we have the concentration of microplastic upstream of the effluent site, and then in gray, and then in black, the concentration downstream of the effluent site. And so pretty clearly at most of these sites, the wastewater treatment plant effluent was a point source of plastic to the stream. And we, uh, we can also examine the kind of relative composition to get an idea of what the wastewater origin might be. So um, this is a composite of the sites uh, with the different shapes illustrated. So most of what we find is fibers, some pellets, and some fragments. And downstream of the wastewater treatment plants, we found more of these pellets, more of these kind of spherical shapes. Again, uh, uh, kind of suggesting wastewater as a source. Ooh, this, I debated about putting this graph in here, so don't look at, don't look at it. Don't look at all of it, anyway. <laughs> this, is a, this is just to illustrate what the kind of microbial data can look like. This is bacterial families on um, four different habitats. It's water column uh, uh, bacteria on the left, and then that's upstream of the wastewater treatment plant. Then water column bacteria next. Then we have the material from the nets. So we have the organic stuff, the ceston from the nets, and then the microplastic from the nets. And what we're most interested in is what's the difference between the bacteria living on plastic relative to the bacteria on the nets, on the organic material. And there's a couple of different um, uh, taxa or bacterial families that were significant and might be uh, kind of ecologically important here too. One of them was the pseudomonads. Uh, some of these have been implicated in oil degradation and might have the capacity for breaking down these long hydrocarbon polymers. So there's the potential for selecting for maybe uh, plastic decomposers. And then up at the top is Campylobacter uh, and the neighbor adjacent to it are indicative of um, uh, gastrointestinal um, uh, uh, bacteria, some of which are pathogenic. And somehow, uh, those organisms were surviving on the plastic surface, even though they've gone through the tertiary uh, sterilization process. So we kind of took this to, to mean that plastic surfaces might offer potentially some kind of uh, refuge from tertiary treatment for some of these um, potentially um, uh, these, these taxa of concern in urban freshwaters. So 
That was all I want to say about that. Uh, uh, the take home points from this is that uh, we are considering wastewater treatment plant effluent as one of the point sources of microplastic to these urban rivers. There's a lot of variation and a lot of questions still to address. And we know there's others, other sources and sinks um, that affect concentration like uh, combined sewers, street runoff, um, differences in geomorphology and hydrology, as well as aerial deposition, so it's in the dust. And uh, we took this to kind of conclude that plastic has unique microbial communities um, that might be novel and might have the capacity to transport um, these unique microbial communities over long distances in a way that naturally occurring surfaces cannot. So we wanted to know also where does the plastic go? Um, everyone who's done this kind of work um, looks and says, well, how much plastic is coming out of these rivers and, and how far downstream does it go? And there's, when you start to scale up, you get into some really high numbers, um, and it's uh, concerning. And one of the ways we've tried to put this in context is with a study that is funded uh, by the Illinois Indiana Sea Grant. So thank you, guys, here. Uh, examining the riverine contribution of um, microplastic to Lake Michigan. So we've got uh, a, a postdoc here, Rachel McNish, who's done really all this work and, and a whole lot of students. But what this project has allowed us to do is to take these watersheds of Lake Michigan. We're looking at the eight largest watersheds. Um, they span a land use gradient. So we've got the more urban ag um, uh, watersheds towards the south, the more rural forested watersheds up north. And we're looking to see what are the sources and sinks of microplastic, what landscape features are affecting microplastic. Um, we do this seasonally, so we want to get an idea of how much comes out of the rivers to the lake on an annual basis. And we measure the same kinds of things with the microbes, but also um, invertebrates and fish. So I'm going to show you a little bit of this data uh, that we have so far. This is from three of our eight rivers that are kind of contrasting in terms of their land use. We heard about a few of these earlier. I've got the Muskegon River, which is northern Michigan and forested. Milwaukee is an urban river. And then the St. Joe, which is in uh, southwest Michigan, northwest Indiana, which is kind of an agricultural, also somewhat urbanized kind of place here. So this is plastic concentrations from grab samples. These are one liter um, glass bottles we put in the water and filter them and count the plastic. And there's a lot in there. So um, it kind of clearly went along with what we expected in terms of land use. Um, we might have thought the urban one had more, but um, the forest one definitely has less, so we're half right, I guess. And we have the concentration on the left and the flux on the right. So flux is a term that's the, the number of particles that are, that are coming out of the river per, on a daily basis. So if you're standing there at the river where it meets the lake, um, this is the number of particles that would move by you in a 24-hour period. And it's a really, really high number. Um, I can show you some of the fish data, too. We've collected a lot of minnows. We use a kind of seining approach to opportunistically grab what we can um, that are present near our boat launch. And uh, so far, we have 74 fish. We've got 11 species. Um, we digest the stomach out of this and, and uh, dissect the, the stomach and then digest the contents to look at the plastic. And we, uh, like I said, have found found it in about 98%. So almost every fish has some amount of plastic in it. And these are almost all uh, fibers. So here's what the concentrations look like. We expected the fish uh, patterns to look the same among these three different rivers. But when we looked at it, it turns out um, the, the fish had uh, the same, the same concentrations among these three different sites. And so we think that you know we've got sediment samples. We've got other kinds of things to look at to see where the fish might be getting their plastic from, but um, they're, they're pretty similar by location. There are more differences when we look by species. So this is the microplastic content, number of particles per fish uh, for our different species. Um, and they're kind of organized as best we can by feeding group here. So the round gobies, which is an invasive fish, have the most, and then on down to the least with the shad. So uh, this might tell us a little bit that the, the more higher on the food chain, the, the, the higher the plastic, but it's really not definitive. Um, and we've looked at it some other ways. This is showing you in the top left the number of microplastic per fish relative to fish size. So there isn't really a relationship there, um, except for when we look at gobies. I don't know if that... 
Gobies is down underneath. This is the round goby, so the number of plastic particles in a goby is positively related to the goby size. So the bigger gobies have more plastic in them. Um, and here it is, the number of plastic particles per uh, fish on the top right, uh, relative to its trophic position. Um, it's positive, but doesn't really explain a lot of variation. So we've got um, a couple hundred more fish to add to this, so we'll see if that changes anything or if it just makes it uh, messier when we look at these graphs. <laughs> I imagine it'll be messy. All right, so uh, that's some of the work we've been doing with plastic. We have a few other projects going on as well. I'd be happy to, to talk to you about them if you're interested. But I also wanted to go over uh, the other kinds of material, garbage, and I thought I'd look at a few that we've done on beaches, on Great Lakes beaches, like Michigan in particular. So I thought this would be good because this was just in the news. I imagine you are a group of people who are alert to this. This came out just a few weeks ago. Um, a study on an isolated island in the South Pacific um, was deemed the most polluted place on Earth by the press in that there were very rapid rates of accumulation of litter. So the researchers would clear it, and then all this garbage would show back up on the beach. Um, so it, it was a, a, a topic of interest. And, and here in this region, we have beaches. We're not in the ocean, but we do have really nice beaches. This is North Avenue Beach in Chicago. And uh, we've got other all sorts of great beaches, so, uh, Sleeping Bear Dunes up in northern Michigan. And these beaches are a critical part of our, um, our economy, our, our culture, our kind of sense of place, and they have garbage on them as well. So we've been studying the assemblage of materials on these beaches. And, one of the ways that we've really benefited in this research is by collaboration with the Alliance for the Great Lakes. This is a nonprofit advocacy group that uh, runs a whole bunch of different programs, but one of the programs is Adopt a Beach, which is where volunteers sign up, they clean up garbage off the beaches all over the Great Lakes. And I did this with my class for extra credit, and then I realized, you know, one of the even better things about this is that the, the volunteers have a, a data sheet and has a bunch of categories on it, and they tally what they're finding. So they give this to their group leader, and the group leader upload, uploads it onto the internet. So I realized there was a big, sort of vast data set out there of Great Lakes Beach garbage. And for me, that was just what I was, <laughs> just what I was looking for. So uh, we've been working with, together to analyze their data because um, it's really fantastic that they've been not only cleaning the beaches, but recording what's, what's on them. So I thought I'd tell you about our first project here with them. This is for Lake Michigan. We picked a, a, just a couple different beaches that we thought spread a, a gradient of, of land use and uh, urban intensity. So we've got uh, Chicago and Gary down at the south, and then up towards Door County and Sleeping Bear in north. Again, it's a really busy table, so don't look at it. <laughs> don't, look, don't worry about the details. This is showing our five sites uh, at county populations. Um, we can generate lots of different information. The EPA records lots of different physical variables about these kinds of beaches, and we have um, uh, the kind of government, municipal cleaning data, and we've also got the um, adopt a beach records for all of these beaches. So again, don't look at it all. I'm just pointing out that we have a lot of information about them. We're so fortunate to have the activity of these volunteers who we call citizen scientists because they're contributing data. So for example, in North Avenue, this particular data set had 54 individual beach cleanups representing the activity of about 1,800 individuals. So it's a lot of people and it's way more than we could ever do on our own. Uh, so here's what this kind of data looks like. Here we've got our approximation of litter density at our five sites, so from North Avenue in Chicago down to Sleeping Bear as the more rural site. And we found that the more urban sites were more litter filled, perhaps not surprising. But we were a little surprised that the fall had more garbage than the summertime because you know, around here, people don't go to the beach much, except in the summer, uh, because it's so cold, especially in Lake Michigan. Uh, but what we think this is related to is the beach cleaning schedules. So each of these beaches are cleaned through about Labor Day. And, you know, in, the, in September, it's still nice around here and up north, and people still going to the beach. So we think the fall is highest because there's still some people around, but no cleaning up. Here's what the kind of assemblage of litter looks like on these beaches. These categories are delineated by the Adopt a Beach website. We've got food related, smoking related, waterway, which would include boating and fishing, um, dumping and, and uh, hygiene and other. 
And uh, almost every time we've done this, and we've done this for a lot of beaches now, it's a lot of cigarette butts, so smoking, uh, and a lot of um, bottles and, and cans and food-related litter. So, so uh, that's what we see. That's where a lot of this material is coming from, and we blame people at the beach. That's who's probably doing this. So uh, we think our data sets, the assemblage, the, uh, the differences among seasons, the differences among sites, all suggest that at these beaches, people who go to the beach, they do what they like to do. They like to smoke and eat and drink and hang out at the beach and leave some of that garbage behind. Uh, and that is unfortunate, but you know what's the positive perspective on that is these beaches have local sources of litter, which to me suggests the solutions are local as well. So if you think about that isolated Pacific island, the solutions to that garbage are international in scope. But here we are finding that our, our sources are local. So we can be in the position to make some uh, local recommendations about beach management, which we have, and the Alliance for the Great Lakes has. So I think this means we can offer some suggestions about what types of litter should be targeted, what kinds of strategies might work. And they've talked about using the data for permitting, having litter management plans for activities, various kinds of approaches. One of the like um, funnest ones that we did was this uh, vote with your butt ashtray. This was uh, modeled off a program in London that was pretty successful, where if you were a smoker at the beach, or you're not allowed to smoke on the beach, but you're you know, approaching the beach, you could look at this and vote with your cigarette butt, uh, which of these do you prefer? And there were multiple different kinds of questions that went into these. Um, so you just vote that way. And I had a student, Veronica, who uh, was very um, good-spirited in measuring cigarette butt litter all summer last year. And um, we didn't have great success with these, but we have some ideas about how to move forward um, with the idea of trying to create some novel management strategies that have real robust empirical assessments behind them. Similarly, because we know that cigarette butt abundance is really one of the dominant uh, forms of litter on the beaches, we can take the adoptive beach data and look back in time. There's so many uh, beach cleanups that go on. And we've kind of summarized the relative amount of cigarettes on these beaches. So Chicago, Evanston, um, Milwaukee. Over time, since these beach cleanups have been started, and what we found in almost every case is that the relative amount of cigarettes is going down. So we wouldn't be able to know this without these volunteers, but it suggests to us that it's related in some cases to perhaps the uh, smoking bans on the beaches, which has occurred in most of these places, and the, um, also the, cigarette, uh, the, the smoking rates are going down nationally. So we haven't separated those things, and we may not be able to, but we have a new insight into what's going on with this litter based upon this, this really valuable data set. Okay, so one last project I thought I'd tell you about. This is a, a project that we did at a beach right by our campus. So Loyola University has a campus um, in Rogers Park, which is kind of the northernmost neighborhood in Chicago, right on the lake. And we have got quite a few beaches, which is nice. And what we wanted to do was find a beach that didn't get cleaned. The, the Parks Department in Chicago cleans the beaches every day in the summer, which is great. But not great if we want to know how much litter is going on the beaches, because you have to get up so early to get out there before the tractors do. So this particular beach is a dune restoration area. So there's grass growing here. Uh, it's a little hard to tell from this particular picture. But people still use the beach. So it's still actively used, but it isn't cleaned up because um, the, the grass has to grow. So we went out here, uh, some students, they set up some transects, um, which were partially determined by the botanists who wanted to keep us away from certain areas. But we've got the transect there closest to the water and then further away from the water. And this particular beach has a pier on one side. Um, it's kind of a concrete structure all the way down. And then has a vegetation zone, a path. So we have these different kind of habitats in each of these transects. And uh, the students went out there every two weeks. And across a one meter width of transect, they picked up all the garbage. So we knew that anything that showed up in those transects two weeks later was newly added material. So they did this for a year, at least when there wasn't snow, when it's doable. And it allowed us to kind of make some assessments. So this is, uh, not, again, not a great figure. Um, but this is showing the litter abundance on the beach in the fall. Uh, it's a lower right there. For our different habitats, the pier being the dark blue. So that's the one where we found almost always the most litter. 
And then when we examine the same kind of um, uh, data over the course of different seasons, we found, again, fall was the highest time of the litter abundance. So similar kinds of ideas as our initial study. Seasonality was informative in, in determining the um, sources and sinks, and then the, um, the spatial distribution was as well. Because we had these transects going over the course of the year, because we knew the like, net input of litter every two weeks, we could estimate the total amount of garbage added to this beach in one year. So this beach area is about 12, 000, or 11,000 square meters, about the size of two football fields. And um, in the course of 2015, there were 80,000 um, individual litter items added to it. So I feel like I'm always saying that and saying, isn't that a lot? I don't know. <laughs> we have these high numbers. It is what it is. That's the number that we estimated in terms of the input rates to this beach. Um, and the seasonality and assemblage, again, suggested those pesky beachgoers as the primary source of litter rather than offshore sources like shipping or fishing. Um, and that the spatial distribution suggests, just like in the ocean gyres, but on a much, much smaller scale, wind and waves are kind of working to accumulate the litter along with natural materials. In this case, along this kind of structure, this pier that was built into the beach. So we say, if you're going to work towards cleaning this up, we have to target the beachgoers. That's what we learned from this. And if we're going to try to do cleanups that are efficient, we should go to the dirtiest places, which on this particular beach are right along that, that pier area. So there we go. This is um, the, some of the work that we've been putting together to try to fill in these boxes and arrows and, and, and add a landscape, add a freshwater, a limnological perspective on what is otherwise a marine biology field. Um, and it feels like a drop in the bucket. That's what I put on there in that picture. Uh, it's a very small amount of work, even though we've been working hard at it for a few years. I think there's just so much opportunity for additional input to try to add to the relatively sparse data set that we have for freshwaters. And um, you know, I put on this because I thought, well, you don't want to make this too negative. There's some potential solutions. Uh, we've got a lot of questions still about um, ecological uh, insights that can be added using um, this kind of research lens. We also think this sets up some engineering approaches that uh, could be directed towards understanding how plastic alternatives work, um, any sorts of revisions towards finishing uh, steps in wastewater treatment plants. Um, we're also in a position to evaluate whether some of the recent bans and taxes on plastic products are going to be effective. So in Chicago, we have a new plastic bag tax um, that's been effective so far in, in changing consumer habits. But we don't know about uh, the garbage yet, you know, in the, in the beaches, but we'll be able to see. Um, it's also been useful for me, at least where I work, um, to contribute to some of the institutional policies and practices that go on. Um, the students and I can now offer some advice about what might be um, kind of targets or useful practices for our relatively large institution to engage in as it relates to plastic use um, in catering, conferences, and vending machines. Um, and, you know, always whenever I do this with students and show these kind of data, they, they're often reflecting on their own personal plastic footprint in different ways in which um, it can be reduced or that they can talk about this sort of thing. So all of this is to say that um, here we are. We're in the middle of North America, approximately. <laughs> feels like it. We are continental. We're inland. Um, but we are a part of this linked environment with the marine biologists. And in fact, we might be the, 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 the place in the globe, inland I mean, where uh, a lot of these practices can be most effectively employed because we're talking about um, uh, rivers and lakes that are much smaller in water volume, um, much more tightly connected to the landscape. And so if, if a group like, like ours isn't contributing to the dialogue, I think um, the global problem of plastic pollution is going to kind of suffer from that lack of discourse. So, so I hope that um, everyone feels empowered, that even though we're in the middle of the country, we're still a part of this, this global um, discussion. So I have a lot of students to thank. We have a really, uh, a really great group and um, lots of people that contributed and uh, funding sources and, and organizations. So thank you.